And now David will give us our scripture for this morning. This morning's scripture lesson is Matthew chapter 6, verses 24 to 34. No man can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will honor the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and wealth. For this reason I say to you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat and what you will drink, nor for your body what you will wear. Behold, is not life much more important than food and the body than clothing? Observe the birds of the sky, for they do not sow, neither do they, neither do they harvest nor gather into barns. And yet your Father in heaven feeds them. Are you not much more important than they? Who is among you who can add one cubit to his height by worrying? Why do you worry about your clothing? Observe the wild orchids, how they grow. They do not get tired out, nor do they spin. But I say to you that not even Solomon, with all of his glory, was arrayed like one of them. Now if God clothes in such fashion the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow falls into the fireplace, is he not much more mindful of you, O you of little faith? Therefore do not worry or say, what will we eat? Or what will we drink? Or with what shall we be clothed? For worldly people seek after all these things. Your Father in heaven knows that all of these things are also necessary for you. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will look after itself. Sufficient for each day is its own trouble. And now, Reverend Macaulay will give us our lesson sermon. Well, good morning. Today's lesson is on the dynamics of life. And here we are in February 2011. Tomorrow we celebrate President's Day, which commemorates George Washington's birthday on the 22nd, and Lincoln's birthday on the 12th. I suppose the day also honors all the rest of the presidents, although for me, when I was growing up, the main focus was on George Washington. George Washington, of course, was the first president. He's always been considered the father of our country. We named our national capital after him. In school, we were taught the famous lesson about how George never told a lie. After he chopped down that cherry tree, he was asked whether he did it or if it was someone else. He bravely admitted the error of his ways and told the truth. Of course, from that lesson, we're supposed to learn that it's better to tell the truth than to tell a lie. Nowadays, that lesson isn't quite so clear cut as it was when I was a child. Just as that holiday, originally attributed solely to George Washington, has become somewhat diluted in that we celebrate not only one president's holiday, birthday, but all the president's birthday, so is the, that lesson about telling the truth. Nowadays, the world isn't separated into black and white, but rather, there are many gray areas and truth isn't always as it seems. For example, if we look at a good Agatha Christie mystery, generally, a murder has been committed. There is a group of suspects, and as we watch or read, as we read or watch the play develop, we take guesses as to whom we think is the murderer. Of course, just when we think we know who did it, that person turns up dead, and we come to realize that we were mistaken. The real murderer has misled us, possibly tricking us into thinking it was somebody else. By the way, if you aren't familiar with these great mysteries, I encourage you to read a few or see them on stage. I was privileged to see The Mousetrap in London in the 70s, and I believe at that time it was the longest running show in London. If I'm correct, it's still running today, which shows just how timeless Christie's work is. Just when we think we know and understand something, new evidence comes into play and changes our reality and our perception of reality. My generation grew up believing that Pluto was a planet and that there were nine planets. A few years ago, the truth was shattered when scientists determined that there was a mass of something out there, but that mass doesn't meet our definition of a planet. So for a time, our understanding shifted and we believed there were only eight planets revolving around our sun. 
Recently, however, it was announced that scientists believe that there is, in fact, another planet out there which actually does qualify as a planet. So now, after several iterations of understanding, we're back to having nine planets. We now have to adjust our minds, our understanding, our textbooks, our encyclopedias to accommodate all these changes. And so it goes in many areas of our lives. We think we know and understand something, and suddenly new discoveries, new information, new knowledge is revealed, which turns our world upside down. Sometimes it's for the better. Sometimes it's not so great. We often talk about how there was a time in Columbus's day when people believed the world was flat. And while I had no evidence that they would sail off the edge of the earth, that is, no one actually witnessed a ship sailing off the edge, I imagine they believed it with every fiber of their being, because that was what they had been told all their lives. I suppose the difference between then and now is that we've seen so many changes occur in our lifetimes, we know that there are few hard and fast facts. We can be certain that the law of gravity remains constant on Earth. Without gravity, we would have to reorganize our lives. We'd have to make sure our possessions were tied down. We'd have to change the methodology about how we do almost everything in our lives. Who is to say that anti-gravity is only a dream? It's very likely that somewhere on Earth, some scientist or group of scientists are working on developing an anti-gravity device. At this point, you might be sitting there wondering, what is, how does this affect you and me? A good question. As I was pondering what to talk about this morning, I looked back at the last year. One year ago, I was living in a condo. I was very happy in that condo in many ways. I stayed there for 14 years, which I think is a long time to stay in one place, especially when you're a renter. One year ago, I had no idea that a year later, I would be living in a house for the first time since childhood and I had no idea what new joys and challenges I would face as a homeowner. I've now spent six months in my new home, and some of those joys are just beginning to be revealed to me. I experienced the joy of picking my own orange off the tree, taking it into the kitchen and devouring its sweet, delicious juices. I've experienced the joy of having freshly cut roses throughout the house, even in December. I've experienced the joy of once again having a garage with a workshop where I can use power tools and build things out of wood. Of course, I've also faced the challenge of sharing my home with the ants, of wondering if I would have enough and to spare to heat my house, and hoping that I can face the challenge of keeping the weeds away long enough to let all the other flowers flourish. Of course, the one challenge I haven't figured out how to handle is that of all the various critters that want to eat all the various plants. The squirrels fear nothing and love our apples. I thought the oranges would be safe, but last week I found bits of orange peel in the driveway and the remaining shell of an orange which had been eaten out. I'm still wondering about the lemons, whether we're going to be able to get to make lemonade this summer or whether the critters will be enjoying our lemons instead. We'll see. The point of all this discussion is to say that life is dynamic. Just to make sure that you understand what I mean, let me explain the word dynamic. We often hear that someone is a dynamic speaker or, dynamic or has a dynamic personality. Do you know exactly what that means? I first heard of the, with the word used with respect to microphones. A dynamic microphone is a microphone whose sensitivity is constantly changing. Not all microphones are dynamic. The reason you would want a dynamic microphone is so that you can capture all the sound in a given area. In other words, the sensitivity constantly changes so that it can hear what's up close as well as what's in the distance. If a microphone were not dynamic, you could, for example, only hear what's audible a foot or two away from the microphone. A dynamic microphone sensitivity constantly changes so that you can hear not only what's up close, but also what's in the distance. So the word dynamic means constantly changing. Before defining the word dynamic, 
I was making the point that life is dynamic. Our lives are constantly changing, like it or not. We may feel that we're stuck in a rut and that we may need to make a change, but before we know it, life has provided some new factor that we weren't counting on or expecting, and suddenly our experience changes, hopefully for the better. When we discovered that the world was round, the fear that ships would sail off the edge disappeared. There were still many real things to fear, like weather, but sailing off the edge was not one of them. And of course, commerce became easier as the explorers developed new routes and developed new lands filled and, and discovered new lands filled with yet undiscovered treats. Our friend Huell Hauser on public television did a show last night about orchids and the International Orchid Show in Santa Barbara. While I would not normally take in, an interest in, an or, in orchids, I was fascinated about what I saw. Apparently, there are over 30,000 species of orchids and more than 100,000 hybrids. That is, if I recall my figures correctly, and I think I do. What really fascinated me, however, was something I had never heard before. During World War II, many varieties of orchids were brought from Europe to Santa Barbara for safekeeping because the growers were afraid the bombings in Europe would destroy the entire species of plants. I imagine this rescue work was not limited to or orchids, but probably also included many, many other varieties of plants as well as animals. I guess I realize that when I think about the casualties of war, my only focus is on human lives and in art as well, because we've heard about art treasures that have been stored and, and hidden and disappeared and recovered. But these are another example of people who came before us to whom we owe a debt of gratitude. Of course, it was this effort to preserve the orchids that made Santa Barbara, with its orchid-friendly climate, the international center for orchids that it is today. And I didn't even realize it was an international center for orchids. For those of us who live in Southern California and have not visited the orchid farms, there's yet another treat in store for us, just waiting to be discovered. Recently, I was talking with a young man who was feeling despondent about his situation in life. He has a job, so he's employed, he has a roof over his head, and he doesn't go to bed hungry at night. Yet he's still unhappy because his dreams have not yet manifested. And I think when we were talking, he was feeling as though his dreams may never manifest. To my young friend, I want to encourage him to take a trip to Santa Barbara and check out the orchid farms. One orchid farmer started with 10 to 12 plants and now has enormous greenhouses filled with hundreds of different plants in a vast array of colors and shapes. Another couple we met, another couple met at an orchard farm where they both worked. They fell in love with each other as well as the orchids and got married to each other, not to the orchids and started their own orchid farm across the street from the orchid farm where they met. And today they're growing hundreds of orchids as well. So again, to get back to the point of this morning's lesson, life is dynamic. It's constantly changing. Just when you think you're stuck or that we understand something, something happens or shifts and suddenly what you expected or thought you knew changes. Hopefully these changes are for the better. It's up to us to make the most out of what we have to work with, to use our knowledge and brains to make lemonade out of lemons. I'm sure the couple who got married and started their own orchid farm had no idea what their future would be when they each took a job working in that nursery. You know that whatever you make out of your life is up to you. Granted, life is what happens when we're making plans and often what happens isn't what we planned. Often it's a whole lot better. Getting back to my young friend, his dream, like so many others in Hollywood, is to become a screenwriter. The point of sending him to Santa Barbara to look at the orchid farms is to get him to realize that growth takes time. The couple that started out with 
10 plants now has hundreds, if not thousands of orchids. But that growth didn't happen overnight or even in a month or two. It took years. The process is a growth process and it takes time and an inordinate amount of work to accomplish whatever task you set forth to complete. So don't despair. Remember that life is dynamic. Life is constantly changing. And if you're on the right path with God at your side, knowing that with God all things are possible, how can you go wrong? As usual, I want to remind you to meditate every day, walk with God at your side, and if orchids aren't your thing, go out and take a look around you at your world and create a new experience for yourself. Try a new restaurant. Make a recipe that you haven't tried before. Visit a museum you've never seen before. Or visit one that you haven't been to for a while. They do change their exhibits from time to time, you know. Explore the countryside around you. Expand your horizons. And don't get stuck in your stinking thinking, as Dr. Sheila used to tell us. Remember the meaning of the word dynamic. It's a good thing. And integrate dynamics into your life. We know that change is consistent in life, constant. We know that change is constant in life. Our challenge is to go with the flow of change, just as the surfer rides the waves and takes advantage of that vast energy, power, and motion of the ocean. The surfer can either get into that flow, master, and enjoy that great force, or he can give up or falter and lose his life in the undertow. As we ride the surfboard of life, let us master and enjoy that vast power and energy available in the universe. We can enjoy that ride and live our lives to the fullest, or we can fail, and get pulled into the undertow and lose our lives. Why not enjoy that banquet that God has prepared and is just waiting for us? It's all up to you. Thank you for your attention this morning, and join me now in the acceptance statement. Now, may the light illumine our mind with wisdom. May love fill our heart with understanding. May the one life shine forth from our innermost being so that we walk renewed in light, life, and love today, tomorrow, and forever.